This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we find out how COVID continues to impact Connecticut's incarcerated population. We'll hear from the National COVID Prison Project, a group of public health scientists who've been tracking cases in U.S. correctional facilities. Now, during the pandemic, advocates called on Connecticut officials to commute or shorten a person's sentence. The reduction in the prison population could help prevent widespread COVID infections. Yet it was only recently that the state parole board met to commute the sentences of some individuals. Kellen Lyons covers this topic for the Connecticut Mirror. He joins us now on Zoom. Kel covers the intersection of mental health and criminal justice. He's a Report for America Corps member. Kel, welcome back to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, if you have a family member or loved one incarcerated in Connecticut, you can join us too, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at where we live. I wanted to start, Kel, if you could tell us briefly about the Board of Pardons and Parole. Who are its members? Hi, good morning. Um, so the Board of Pardons and Parole is, they have unfettered discretion as it relates to commutations and they are, they're a three member panel who are able to grant these commutations. Um, like you had mentioned, they had taken a couple of years off to revamp their program and their policy. Um, they were doing uh, parole hearings, uh, essentially looking at other ways of supervised release for the incarcerated population. Um, and then as they revamped that commutation policy, they released, um, these new parameters. And so they've been trying to screen and accept applications through that. Um, the three member panel is, is Deborah Smith Palmieri, uh, Michael Pohl, and the Port of Pardons and Parole chairperson, Carlton Giles. You mentioned they're appointed. And so I'm wondering how this may differ from how other states handle commutations, Kel. Yeah, so it really depends on the state. I mean, in mo- I think the most common instance is the clemency process through governors, um, where it's sort of a direct process and appeal. You see that in some of the some of the states that still have the death penalty where folks are trying to commute or, or grant clemency at the 11th hour before a death penalty case exists. In Connecticut, it's it's sort of a little bit different. Um, there, this is an appointed panel that will screen these applications. Uh, they're appointed, I believe, by the governor, um, confirmed, and then they 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 go about their business. It's sort of like a layer of, of political insulation of sorts um, and that it's, it's not a political, as much of a political body perhaps as a governor who's granting those, those uh, powers. I mentioned that you've been covering this uh, issue of commutations for the Connecticut Mirror. Recently, the parole board shortening the sentences of 11 men, uh, these men who committed crimes uh, when they were young. So can you talk about some of the people who uh, were actually before this parole board and about the commutation process? Sure. So they commuted the sentences of 11 men over the past month or so. And before that, they commuted the sentence of additional of an additional man. So we're talking about a dozen men um, since these new policies have been released. Um, Of the 11, all of them were under the age of 25 at the time of their crime. Um, They were all between the ages of 18 and 25 or so. They they were all serving sentences for murder, attempted murder, felony murder, or arson. Um, And they had all been in prison for decades or more. Um, to, To qualify for an application, you have to have served more than 10 years of a sentence have to be sentenced to more than a decade and not be eligible for parole within the next two years. So we're talking about guys who are doing a lot of time, who have already served a lot of time behind bars um, and who otherwise don't really have an avenue of release in the near future. Um, All the men that you had mentioned, Lucy, they they all were quite young at the time of their crime. Um, They were all convicted of very, very serious violent offenses, but they were the board, the board of Pardons and Parole is essentially recognizing um, the science of juvenile brain development um, with this latest round of commutations because these kids, these guys were all children when they were younger, when they committed these crimes, um, all under the age of 25 um, before the brain is fully developed, which is something that juvenile justice advocates as well as state uh, state officials are starting to recognize that brain development is not complete until when an individual is 18, it actually goes until age, age 25. 
Coming up, we're going to be hearing from uh, one of these individuals whose sentence was commuted, uh, Michael Cox, who you've written about, uh, Kel. Uh, you mentioned that the men who received uh, shorter sentences or their sentence have been shortened by the parole board. Uh, they're uh, people who were convicted of violent crimes. And so can you talk about that and, and some of the conversations uh, that uh, not only advocates are having, but just people in the community about this process and how the board handles that question of of the type of crime that was committed. Sure. So, so the hearings are, are they're roughly about an hour um, after an, an initial pre-screen hearing, um, and the, the board is hearing from. They're essentially asking each of these individuals, you know, what is your disciplinary history been? Uh, most of them haven't had disciplinary tickets or infractions in years at this point. Um, they're asking them about their rehabilitative efforts since they've been incarcerated. Um, they're asking them about their life up to that point and sort of what they were like when they were kids and, and what they are like now. They also are asking them questions about, you know, whether they, how they will handle setbacks, um, how they'll handle um, a situation not going the way that they thought it would go. Um, essentially trying to probe, like, are you able to ask for help? Are you, you know, are you able to reach out when, when you need it? Um, I think at the, at the, advocacy level, I think there's been a lot of push uh, during COVID specifically to try to increase the number of commutations quickly, given that the board has this sort of unfettered discretion um, to to release folks through commutations. Um, but the board is, has has resisted that a little bit in that they came out with their policies, but they really are are emphasizing that this needs an individualized approach. You know, they, they've created, they've They've estimated that there are about 1,070 people who are currently serving a sentence who fit the parameters that they have, um, and they've commuted 12 sentences so far. Um, so they, they did increase the number of uh, hearings that they have had in recent, in recent weeks, which you know, perhaps speaks to the fact that they are, they are trying to ramp this up. But they are not, I don't think that we're going to see them grant large-scale commutations, which is was an idea floated um, when the numbers of COVID in prisons and jails is a bit higher in Connecticut state correctional facilities. So the board's not looking at it as a way to reduce the prison population, so to speak, but thinking about, as you mentioned, as a case-by-case, -case, uh, looking at all of the, the factors uh, that you described. Yeah, I think they're looking at it more as a way to provide relief for individuals who didn't really have a way out otherwise. You know, people who committed these these terrible crimes when they were younger uh, and who have who really turned their lives around while they've been incarcerated and have really spent their entire adulthoods in prison. I mean, that line was used repeatedly over the course of these hearings. These guys, these guys grew up behind bars. You know, they, many of them have spent more time in prison now than they, than they were at the age, at the time of their arrest. Um, so I think the board is looking at it as an, as an opportunity to provide relief, but also to provide an individualized sort of relief to make sure that um, nobody gets out and, and, fails and has to go back to prison. You're hearing Kellen Lyons here on Where We Live. He covers the intersection of mental health and criminal justice for the Connecticut Mirror as we talk about uh, the recent action by the state um, board of pardons and parole uh, to commute the sentences of some individuals. Uh, coming up, we're going to hear more, including from a man who received the first commutation, I believe, and it's been about two years uh, since the board uh, issued a commutation. Uh, Kel, how does the board factor in the statements of, of victims? Victims and their families in this uh, process to decide if a uh, individual sentence should be shortened. Sure. So the victims do get a chance to speak. They've they've made a statement uh, in about maybe half of the hearings or so. Um, they've they've many of them expressed disappointment about their loved ones killer potentially being released before the end of their sentence, saying that it feels as though a broken a promise has been broken. Um, others had talked about. Um, these sleepless nights and, and the ways that they're still grieving. Um, and I mean, it, it really drives home the fact that closure isn't, isn't necessarily possible. Um, it's, it's just something that they've learned to live with. And these hearings have really kind of drawn up um, complex emotions for them, you know, and, and it really speaks to the fact that violent crimes like this and, and, and murders, they, they tend to play out over generations. They don't just affect the person who is, who is killed. It's also, you know, mothers, wives, husbands, children um, who have to go the rest of their lives without speak, seeing or speaking to this person again. And um, each person has, who has spoken has had a very powerful statement um, talking about you know, whether or not they think that an individual should spend the entirety of their time behind bars or whether they think that that individual should um, spend the rest of their sentence there so that then they can, then they 
you know, quote unquote, deserve another chance, things of that nature. But not everyone has said that. I mean, critically, um, there were two instances of, of individuals who were in favor of the commutation that I can recall, one of whom was saying that um, it was really hard for her to accept that this this person took her loved one, but she, if he's able to go out there and, and to, to mentor younger people who are struggling with similar issues, who are struggling with substance abuse and, and things of that nature, then he deserves another chance to go out and help those kids because maybe he can help someone who, who's not gonna end up behind bars and commit that crime and sort of mm-hmm. continue the cycle of violence and incarceration. And if a victim or uh, the family member of a victim is uh, speaks about against the commutation, is that something that the parole board um, weighs in the sense that they may not grant it? I'm just wondering if you can talk more about that that decision making process. I know that it's something that they hear. I don't know that it is. It, it has not affected a commutation as of now. I mean, I would say the majority of the the victims' families who have come out and talked about this have not. Um, it has not resulted in a person not getting a commutation, but I, I know that it is something that the board hears and 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 allows them to say their to say their piece um, as a way of you know, allowing them to to say publicly like whether or not they think that this person deserves to get out before the end of their sentence. Um, but it has not affected a commutation as far as I can see thus far. You're hearing Cal Lyons here on Where We Live. Again, he covers the intersection of mental health and criminal justice for the Connecticut Mirror. He's going to stay with us, and after the break, we're going to talk to a man who was formerly incarcerated. Michael Cox was the first commutation the State Board of Pardons and Parole granted in two years. We'll hear from him and his attorney. You can join us, too, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today, the Connecticut Mirror's Kellen Lyons joins us to talk about criminal justice in our state, specifically policies that have impacted the state's incarcerated since the start of the pandemic. Later on, we'll talk about how COVID-19 impacted those incarcerated and what it looks like today. Now, in December, the State Board of Pardons and Parole granted its first commutation in two years. Michael Cox received that commutation after being incarcerated for 30 years. He joined joins us now on the phone. Michael, welcome to the show. Good morning. Now, I understand that you were sentenced in 1994 when you were just 19 years old for murder and assault. Can you talk about your time in prison and and how it changed over the last few decades? Um, Yes, it it changed uh, dramatically from when I came in and the things that I saw as far as uh, the violence, the gang violence, the drugs, and the assaults and stuff. And now it, it pretty much changed towards programming, and it's easier to, like, take advantage of the programs that are around. It's like what I try to tell the younger uh, generation that are in there, that they don't have to worry about the things that I saw coming up. And I encourage them to like to get their education as far as um, GED, get themselves a trade and stuff like that. Because back then it was pretty hard. You had to worry about either somebody taking your stuff, getting raped, or getting jumped on by different gang members back when I first entered the prison system in 91, early 90s. Early 90s. Now, what about how you changed uh, in that time that you were incarcerated, Michael? First, as as the nineteen year old coming in, and over the decades, you know, how did what programs were you involved in while incarcerated? Um, I was involved in a lot of programs. I was involved in in Gardner, who's in charge. I helped um, form. The lifer groups would turn into the turning point program. I chaired AA, NA meetings, um, a lot of uh, self-help programs that um, helped me go in the right direction for me to start to realize that I was sick and tired of being non-productive in a system that says that it's geared towards rehabilitation. But for me, I had to learn to rehabilitate myself and want for myself because if you're sitting around in the stupor, you're not going to excel. 
and that continued to grow as far as the lifers group and i was part of the uh, cheshire mentors group which turned into the uh true unit i sung in the gospel choir from uh cheshire and all over any opportunity that i got the chance to sing and i attended bible college um in mayus Charles Stanley Institute uh, correspondence and other college courses um, around uh, Ashford's College uh, course in uh, Atlanta and uh, Nunnachuck Valley Community College over there right outside of um, Garner and stuff. But I believed in um, surely um, educating myself because I grew up knowing that a mind was a terrible thing to waste. So I didn't go out to try to do every program that was in the prison system. But what was made available to me, I've done. And that's where the um, prison system kind of changed now, where I talked about you have to rehabilitate yourself. Because an individual like me, those programs, a lot of the programs back then were open for everybody. But now, now you got individuals that if you got a whole bunch of time, the programs will tell you you got too much time and it's geared towards individuals that got less time. So what happens when you get a commutation or something that lessens your sentence and you're not even prepared to go back out to society? You haven't had any treatment or eligibility of the programs because they haven't allowed you. They told you no because you had too much time. So when did you first learn of the commutation process and why did you think that, that you were the right uh, person to receive a shortened sentence, Michael? I learned of it probably about uh, 2020. Um, I, I had a habeas and I had a habeas and, and um, we were trying to fight to get the uh, sentence uh, lesson. And then I was, I was told about it um, through my current lawyer, Alex Tavares, as well as Samantha Conway. And at first she put it in and they didn't deny us. They just told us that they closed it down to uh, revamp uh, their system and what they was doing. And then um, Alex came in and uh, closed the deal. Uh, again, you were originally sentenced, I believe, to 75 years for yes. uh, crimes that you committed as a 19-year-old. Yes. And so how did you prepare for the commutation, including you know, the question that some of our listeners may have now, which is, you know, you know, the crimes that you were convicted of were very serious, murder and yes. assault, and, and why sh you should be able to get a, a shortened sentence, Michael. Well, I don't know if prepare, because I never knew about it, but when I came in, um, my book is an open book as far as I've done programming from when I came in all the way to the end. And like I said, I believe in higher learning and educating. And it just so happened, all the things that I've done and the direction I was going in, it just so happened to make me be a perfect fit for a commutation. Some people call me a, a model prisoner. Um, I just call educating myself and preparing because I've always prepared for the door to open up and for the unique opportunity. And if I may, to all the people that are listening and the people that are incarcerated listen, you never know when the door opens. So you should always prepare like the door is going to open tomorrow. If you got an opportunity to do something great or get involved in it, rehabilitate yourself, uh, learn, teach yourself and prepare because the world out here is a lot different. And I was incarcerated for 30 years. And with an education, with a GED, or preparing for your steps out here, don't prepare for the old ways. you got to prepare for the um, new ways. Mm -hmm. And I think my record speaks for itself. Though everything that I did, it doesn't take away from uh, the crimes that I committed. But... If you, if you look, I, I was ready to be part of uh, society. I, I, I prepared myself. And um, there's nothing that I can say to take away from the heinous crimes that I did. And I, I apologize. I, I pray. And if there's anything to do, I can't bring them back. But I would do it. I would do it in a heartbeat because I realized the thinking that I was back then to now and all the things that I've been through. And if I would have known 
how to treat myself through the trauma that I've been through in life, I, w- I would have been able to um, do it. But to, I would agree that I, I believe if people looked at my background and all that I accomplished, they would see that they would want me home being productive and doing the things. Though my health is failing, I'm trying to get better with each day. Michael, we're going to be talking to your attorney in just a couple of minutes, but I have to ask when you learned that your sentence would be commuted and then, or commutated, and then you also um, got compassionate uh, release, uh, what was your reaction? I, I, I thank the Lord because it's been a long fight. I, I, I thank all the lawyers and all the people that trusted, that believed in me. Um, it's, it's truly a blessing. It's truly a, a miracle to be able to, my life was given back to me. And I've been able to, you know, be reconnected with my family, my loved ones, my children. And it was, yeah, if you look, I cried through the whole process. I kind of knew when when they gave me the chance to get in front of them and they saw me not as a prisoner, but as a human being and the things that I did. I think I showed them that I wanted to be home. I wanted to be in a free society. I wanted to be a part of the things in this world and give back that through mentoring or whatever I can do, give testimony about what I saw, what I did and um, building on my moral compass on the right way to go and making the right decisions because everything isn't always about when you get mad to just do what you want. You got to learn how to assess the situations and things and make the right decisions and choices in life. And I'm prepared to do that versus when I was 18, 19 year old running around, not caring about anybody else because I had problems within myself that needed to be fixed. And I, I, uh, before I close, I like to say up uh, going to prison, it, it saved my life. It allowed me to look at myself and deal with the trauma that I had through programs. And there's many other individuals that I know that, you know, most of us are running around with trauma and don't know how to really face them, deal with them, or to move on. But I learned through the rehabilitation and going through programs and taking them seriously to apply. And I'm still learning even today with family members and adjusted to um, society out here. You're hearing Michael Cox again here on Where We Live, uh, the State Board of Pardons and Parole, uh, commuting his sentence from 75 years. Uh, He served 30 years again, and he's now on the outside. Uh, Michael, I I just have to ask, you know, what has it been like for you on the outside? Uh, What have been the biggest challenges that you've encountered so far? Well, the biggest challenge is is, um, getting everything together for me. As far as uh, social security and disability, a lot of doors has been shut to me, whereas I thought that um, it would be uh, easier for me to get into knowing that I just came out here and I have nothing. And um, it's a it's a process because you figure after 30 years of making plans and knowing that I want to get out here and work and do things, but my health has... Um, not allow me to do certain things. I'm I'm currently searching for help from anybody and everybody to help me um try to get some type of financial relief or anything. And and, and it's it's a it's one day at a time process, which I'm not used to because I had all these plans to make to succeed and just coming out here and taking everything slow. I got bills to pay. Uh, um rent to pay and stuff and, and nothing to come in to um, contribute. You know, I, um, it's a blessing to have family members and everything, but, you know, it, it's difficult when you're not able to uh, do things. I'll take that out. Well, Michael, I wanted to hear from your attorney now. Uh, Alex Talbis joins us. He's a civil rights lawyer uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. Alex worked on Michael's commutation and with five other incarcerated men who appeared recently before the State Board of Pardons and Parole. Alex, welcome to our show. Good morning, Lucy. Thank Uh, you for having me. Thank you for coming on. Uh, Michael talked uh, a few times about his health, and so I'm wondering if you can uh, tell us about more about your client and how the Board of Pardons and Paroles weighed uh, you know, his medical condition with the ability to be released uh, before the completion of the 75-year sentence. 
Yes, Lucy, the board uh, indicated at its hearing that they took into serious account Michael's uh, medical conditions when they granted his commutation. Uh, he, these co med serious medical conditions are always very difficult to manage and handle while incarcerated. The department and medical uh, system is very understaffed and uh, a lot of medical providers struggle with treating uh, patients who are incarcerated. And then COVID-19 uh, makes those challenges a million times worse and difficult to manage. So the Board of Pardons and Paroles was very wise to, to take that into account in considering Michael's case, although uh, it, given the extraordinary uh, circumstances of Michael's rehabilitation, uh, I, I only regret that it took such serious health concerns to give him that opportunity. And I'm glad to see that other people who may not have as serious health conditions, but who are seriously deserving of a second chance are also getting a look from the parole board. So let's talk about the recent actions by the parole board. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Kel's reporting earlier, the parole board shortening the sentences of 11 men whose crimes uh, were committed when they were young. You represented, I believe, five of them. I think the last commutation before this round was way back in 2019, of course, before the pandemic. And so uh, talk through this process and what do you expect to see uh, from this board in the months ahead? Or was this kind of a, a one off? I very much hope that it was not a one-off. Lucy, I've uh, helped uh, dozens of men apply for commutations in the last couple months, and I believe the board is now considering many of those applications that they'll be coming up for pre-screens in March and hopefully hearings in May. I did represent five men in the last round of hearings last month, men who ranged from the age of 15 at the time of their crime to 23 at the time of their crime all of whom have spent decades uh, in the big house here in Connecticut, who have shown exemplary conduct, remorse, acceptance of responsibility. And they, the board uh, did a very deep dive on each of these individuals. Um, they interviewed them multiple times. They looked at all of their records, did a complete background check, looked at their crimes, the police reports from their crimes, and then had a full public hearing where, as Cal mentioned, uh, the families of the victims also had a right to give their piece and to say what they believed and also had the opportunity, hopefully, to hear uh, my clients and, and the other men apologize uh, or, or give their condolences. Um, because remember, not everybody in prison is guilty. And that's something that I hope the parole board will also look at in some cases. And so we're hoping that the parole board will grant many more commutations in May, because although Michael is unique, there's many ways in which he's not unique, both for men and women uh, who have been excessively sentenced, because it's not simply small drug crimes and, and um, things that shouldn't be crimes that get people put in prison to create mass incarceration. It's also overly long sentences that keep people in prison after they're rehabilitated and after they've served a great price to society by being separated from their families for decades. I asked the same question of Michael, but with you as well, Alex, as you're representing several of these men, uh, when we think about some of the crimes that were committed and they were convicted, I'm wondering if you can talk about that because of the what you just shared about, you know, how long is a suitable sentence if someone is uh, making strides uh, to improve themselves and be rehabilitated? Well, I firmly believe that we should not have death sentences, whether by lethal injection or by a prison cell in the state of Connecticut. I believe that we should have prison sentences that always take into account the possibility of rehabilitation and redemption. And uh, for individuals who have served uh, decades behind prison, who have, who have made the contributions like Michael has made, they all deserve at least the chance to go in front of some like, someplace like the parole board or maybe a, a judge uh, to make their case and ask. And everyone should have a, a, a chance to put input into that, the state of Connecticut, the victims, families, 
uh, the families of the person who is incarcerated. And uh, we, we should look at people and consider them as human beings, even when they've committed the most horrible crimes, because we have to recognize that people can change, especially people who were young when they committed crimes, but also people who have untreated mental health issues when they commit crimes or who commit crimes while under the influence of drugs and alcohol. People are not necessarily just the worst thing that they ever have done. They're, they're more than that. They're more than that to themselves and they're more than that to the people who love them and care about them. And although victims' families do should have the right to speak and to be heard and to have input and influence, I do not believe that they should have a veto per, in perpetuity over whether a person should be kept incarcerated. So what happens now, Alex, as Michael mentioned, you know, there are some challenges when anyone um, leaves a correctional facility after some time. He was sentenced when he was 19. He spent more time in uh, prison than when he lived uh, on the outside before being sentenced. And so what are the resources available? Is this supervised release? I mean, how do you how do how does the system help these individuals besides just shortening their sentence or granting uh, compassionate or, or medical release? So one of the things that the board looks at is the support system and the network that exists for people who they are considering for an earlier release. And that existed in Michael's case. But in addition to that, the board understands that for people who committed crimes for which they're ineligible for parole, if they don't provide a commutation, then when that individual who's ineligible parole reaches the end of their sentence, 100% of their sentence, they're just released onto the street with nothing. But through the commutation process, the board is actually able to, while shortening the sentence, also provide for a period under which that person has some parole supervision, meaning a parole officer who they can who they can get assistance from and be connected to services and and also be monitored. But we believe that in most of these cases, the risk of 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 committing more crimes is, is very low. It's really more about helping them succeed and thrive rather than preventing them from going and committing another crime. And so that has been a very positive aspect of the commutation process is that it's it's providing relief as well as a helping hand to the people. And I really commend the parole board for combining those two goals. You're hearing Alex Talbis here on Where We Live, a civil rights lawyer in New Haven who represented Michael Cox, who we also heard from. Alex and Michael, thank you for coming on the show. Thank, thank you. you. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, the nonpartisan prison policy initiative gave Connecticut jails and prisons a failing grade last September for its response to coronavirus in prisons, saying Connecticut released fewer people on parole in 2020 than in 2019, and the state failed to utilize one of the easiest tools for reducing the prison population, stopping prison admissions for technical violations of probation and parole, which the initiative says are not crimes. What does COVID look like in Connecticut correctional facilities now, especially after the Omicron surge? And have there been any changes in the way the state has responded? We want we talk to the National COVID Prison Project after the break. You can join us too. find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Across the country, data on COVID-19 in American prisons and jails can be hard to come by, but my next guest co-founded a project to track the virus's impact inside the nation's correctional facilities. The COVID prison project has found infection rates among incarcerated people are nearly five times higher than the national average, and the death rates are three times higher. With us now on Zoom is Dr. Lauren Brinkley Rubenstein, again, co-founder of COVID Prison Project project. She's Associate Professor of Social Medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. Lauren, welcome to our show. 
Thanks for having me. So uh, we're starting to uh, see maybe some of this Omicron surge uh, uh, decreasing in particular states. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about what we're seeing in uh, prisons, uh, population and jails around our country when we think about COVID cases and deaths. Sure. So if we look at COVID cases to date, we see that there have been over 560,000 cases among people who are incarcerated in prisons. Uh, nearly 2,800 deaths. When we look at staff, we see um, numbers that are near 200,000 um, cases for people who are working in prisons and about 267 deaths. Um, these numbers, as you said before, are much higher than what we see in the general population. Um, and we see that um, with each wave, you know, we see um, high rates in the community, but we see even higher rates behind the bars. When we talk about people who are incarcerated, uh, many of them have pre-existing medical conditions, and so I'm wondering how correctional facilities have accommodated them in this pandemic. Yeah, so um, one of the reasons that uh, prisons are prisons and jails are sites of risk are really because people who are incarcerated, on average, have at least one chronic condition. So that's puts them at um, risk of suffering severely from COVID-19. We've seen um, some uh, responses that are um, proportionate to that risk. Um, in a lot of places, we haven't. The ways that we might accommodate uh, people who are incarcerated who we know are at more severe risk would include uh, increased testing, um, robust vaccine um, programs, and the ability to properly isolate people who have COVID and quarantine people who have been exposed. Um, you know, those are the ways that we're doing it in the community, um, but it's even more important that uh, we engage in these mitigation strategies in prisons and jails. Earlier, we heard from Kellen Lyons about how advocates in our state had asked uh, state officials to you know, release people maybe earlier than their sentence concluded uh, to maybe grant more commutations, especially when the pandemic was, um, you know, there were really higher cases and when it was hitting the, the correctional facilities pretty hard. Did we see that happen in other states, Lauren? It has varied over time. If we look at the, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, you know, before summer 2020, we saw that jails on average um, reduced their population by about 30 percent. Prisons reduced their populations by much less, around 5 percent. It's easier for jails in some ways to release people. Many of the people who are there are um, pretrial, so they're awaiting um, their court date. And so, um, you know, more mechanisms exist to release people quickly. But unfortunately, what we've seen is that uh, as time has gone on, the numbers of people who are incarcerated currently uh, is about the same as it was pre-pandemic. So there actually hasn't been a, a big change um, in most states across the country. Uh, Kellen Lyons is still with us. Uh, Kel, remind us how the Omicron surge impacted correctional facilities in our state. Sure. So we saw a spike after the holidays, um, as did the community, as did other prison systems, from what I understand. I mean, there, the system was, was quite strained. I mean, we were looking at about 600 incarcerated people who had the virus um, and about almost 20 percent of correction staff had COVID as well and were out of work. Um, the system was, was really strained at that time. It has gone down a little bit since then. Um, as of yesterday, there were 188 staff who had COVID and about 287 incarcerated people. Um, but it is, it is not as bad as it was a couple or month or so ago. And recent deaths, Kel? There are 28 people who have died from COVID in correctional facilities. Is that from the start of the pandemic? Yeah, since March 1st of 2020. So let's talk about when we, we think about these cases that are uh, still uh, within the correctional facilities among staff as also as well as those who are incarcerated. You know, what does vaccine uh, uptake look like? You know, are, is there still an issue with hesitancy and is that impacted? How has that impacted staff and those who are incarcerated? It is low among staff and the incarcerated. About two thirds of correction staff have gotten the vaccine at this point. Um, 
And I mean, there's a lot of reasons as to why it hasn't gotten higher. The last I checked, they were the they had the lowest compliance with the governor's executive order among executive branch agencies. Um, you know, it's it's kind of what you're what you're hearing in the community, in that um, there are some conspiracy theories that exist out there uh, among corrections staff. There are also, you know, they know a lot of they work in the system, and they know a lot of people who have been vaccinated and who uh, have continued to get the virus. Um, as for the incarcerated themselves, I mean, about 3,340 incarcerated folks have gotten the vaccine. Um, there's about 9,700 people who are in prisons and jails. Um, again, that's also a pretty diverse range of reasons. I mean, you have a lot of guys who just generally distrust the medical care in prisons and jails because um, it's a strained healthcare system. Um, you also have guys who you know, are also subscribing to conspiracy, anti-vax conspiracy theories. Um, and then you also have folks who have seen their friends get it and they, who have gotten the vaccine. I've had guys tell me they've gotten, they've gotten COVID five times, you know, so they think that they're fine at this point. Um, you're starting to really see a strain. Oh, I mean, there has been a strain on the correction system in Connecticut uh, in that it, it's, it, prisons and jails are never an ideal place to be and or work, um, but it has been particularly strained during COVID. I mean, correction staff morale is, is quite low. Um, they're, they're having to cover for their colleagues often. If they're out of work, they're, they're working mandatory overtime all the time, uh, or at least they were when, when the surge was, was worse a couple of weeks ago. It has gotten better, but it has been sort of been going through waves throughout the past two years. And the incarcerated themselves have been dealing with largely solitary, isolated confinement for a couple of years. I mean, the DOC is taking them out of their cells every day, um, most of the time, unless there's a serious outbreak, uh, to use the phones and to shower. But I mean, these are folks who haven't really seen their families much over the past few years and who have been you know, largely confined to cells at different points of the pandemic. Um, it's been it's been tough. I mean, morale for, for everyone all around has been strained. Uh, Lauren Brinkley Rubenstein is still with us, co-founder of the COVID Prison Project. Lauren, can you respond to what Kel just shared about uh, the challenges that remain even within Connecticut's correctional facility? Have there been any policy changes that you've seen in other states uh, that um, have turned out for the good because of all of the challenges that remain in this pandemic? I think what we've seen across the country largely mirrors what we what you're seeing in Connecticut. So what Kel is saying really rings true. I think across the board, um, you know, when when Kel talked about um, staff shortages and the morale and, um, and and the strain that's on the system, to me, in many ways, that um, underscores the fact that we haven't released enough people in this country. Um, you know, the, the best way to mitigate COVID for both staff and people who are incarcerated is uh, decarceration to reduce the number of people that are exposed to the risk setting. Um, and so, you know, staff shortages really underscore, again, why we ought to think about release as our top priority relevant to stopping outbreaks in correctional facilities. And Kelly also shared uh, the use of solitary uh, when we think about isolating uh, people because of this virus. But, you know, we've done several shows on this, that uh, the consequences of people uh, being isolated away from their family, not being able to talk to anyone, and then, you know, in a, a cell uh, for many hours of the day, that can be problematic, too. That's right. You know, the um, solitary confinement has been defined by international bodies as torture. And there's been a movement to get rid of its use altogether. Um, our group has shown that any amount of solitary confinement increases the risk of post-release death. So long-term consequences of solitary confinement, yet in the context of the pandemic, we've seen it used more than ever. And in some ways it's a troubling um, problem to solve uh, relevant to COVID, because if you if you have a facility that is congregate style, that is a dormitory where there's that's overcrowded, perhaps on baseline, where there's little ability to social distance, you have large scale outbreaks. If you need to medically isolate or quarantine people, sometimes the only space in your facility that you can do that that has four walls, a ceiling, and a door that shuts, is a solitary unit. Um, and so we've seen uh, a turn toward these units uh, for medical purposes. But I think, as you, as you said, it's still a traumatizing space. Um, it is still torture to isolate people in these extreme ways. There has been some good guidance on how to minimize the risk of 
um, having to use solitary for medical isolation and quarantine, a group at the University of um, California, San Francisco, AMEND, recommends turning those units into medical units that are then um, uh, uh, governed by medical staff rather than correctional officers. So um, we do see an increased use of solitary confinement. We don't want it. When we have to use it, um, we should totally reimagine its use so that it's um, a, a space for healing and for medical purposes only. Mm-hmm. Akel, uh, before we run out of time, um, as Lauren mentioned, uh, decarceration. And so as the session's about to begin, I believe it's tomorrow's opening day. What are you hearing from advocates on some of the proposals they hope that lawmakers were, will address this session related to the states incarcerated? <laughs> I certainly think you'll see a push uh, to expand the use of compassionate release, which is something we touched on earlier in the show. Um, it's, a, it's a narrow form of parole that essentially requires an incarcerated person to have served half of their sentence before they are eligible for that release. So for those like Michael Cox, who were serving 75 year sentences, um, he still was several years away from that halfway point of his sentence. And there was a push in the last session to do that, um, but it ultimately failed after passing through the Senate. Uh, I know that um, Senator Gary Winfield, the co-chair of the Judiciary Committee, has said that he is going to push that bill again. I also think you're going to see another big push to try to end solitary confinement in the state's prisons and jails. Um, That bill, the PROTECT Act, was passed last year in last session, but it was vetoed by the governor and replaced by another executive order. Um, Advocates uh, remain frustrated that 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 they feel that that executive order did not go far enough. And I would expect another push to try to get the PROTECT Act again uh, across the finish line to the governor's desk yet again. That's Kellen Lyons, who covers the intersection of mental health and criminal justice for the Connecticut Mirror. Uh, Lauren, uh, before we end, I I need to ask uh, about federal prisons. And when we think about data collection, uh, what can you tell us briefly about um, what it looks like, COVID looks like in, in federal settings? Sure. So um, the federal system has a lot of people who are incarcerated, has prisons in almost every state. Um, They have a home confinement program, uh, which is um, similar to discretionary release, um, although there's been some uh, discussion around whether those folks have to come back to federal prison. Um, Over 30,000 people have been um, released on home confinement, um, much less uh, many uh, fewer people have been released on uh, compassionate um, release mechanisms. Um, the data in the federal system is not very good, um, and it's been a chronic problem uh, over uh, the the duration of the pandemic, although there has been some movement to standardize data collection. But we've seen the same thing uh, that we've seen across the country in the federal system as well. Spikes uh, when we see different variants and having those spikes be much larger than we're seeing in the community. Um, And there is some good federal legislation that has been imagined and conceptualized relevant to release, testing, vaccination, et cetera. And I'm I'm hopeful that those um, move through um, the the federal government and, and, and are realized. You've been hearing Dr. Lauren Brinkley Rubenstein, co-founder of the COVID Prison Project. She's associate professor of social medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. Lauren, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And we'll be sure to tweet out some links to Kel Lyons, great reporting for the Connecticut Mirror. You can check out uh, the links at, at Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical director is Kat Pastor. We'll be back tomorrow.